turn again tonight to Revelation chapter 12. John is introducing us to three definite personalities that we've already looked, two of them we've already looked at. The first one was the woman, and that's representative of the nation of Israel. She was with child, and the child that she gave birth to is Messiah. And the third one is the great red dragon, Satan. And we were introduced to a Super Bowl that the world will never know. The battle in heaven between the demonic forces and Michael and the good angels. I just call them good angels. And they were unable to overcome Michael and the angels. Now, in the time frame, and again, keep this in your mind, this is probably the middle of the tribulation period when this occurred. And once they are defeated, they're kicked out of heaven. And that all sounds sort of strange to us because we don't give much attention to that. We don't think there's much demonic activity going on today. But here... We find Michael and his angels waging war with the dragons, the dragon and his demonic spirits. We're in the spiritual realm. And I think I shared with you last week, there are some very competent scholars who believe that this particular battle began with the rapture when maybe Satan was trying to keep the bride of Christ from going up. And again, sometimes we don't seem to recognize that the first and the second heavens, we are now the domain of Satan and his angels. And this may be the very reason that Michael the archangel is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. And all of us need to understand tonight, he's not a messenger angel, folks, he's a warrior. He is the guardian angel of the nation of Israel. And here in the middle of the tribulation, he becomes the commander in chief of the heavenly host who engage in this conflict with Satan and his fall, fallen angels. And John tells us that Satan were, and his angels were not powerful enough to overcome Michael and his angels. Can you even picture that in a, your mind? Can't grasp that or comprehend that. Now follow this very carefully because this is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. They are thrown down to the earth. And John describes him as the one deceiving the whole world. And that word deceive means to lead somebody astray to lead them out of the path of truth into error. They are thrown out of heaven with a force, and it is such a thorough act that all of heaven will now be cleansed and rid of satanic influence. And again, as you look at this in context, this probably is the middle of the tribulation period. And verse 13 of chapter 12 tells us, that when he is cast down to the earth, he immediately begins an intense persecution against the Jews. Wow. He's a great dragon. He has more power than you and I can even imagine. He is the serpent of old. He was the instigator of disobedience and death in the Garden of Eden. He is subtle. He is dangerous. He's also called the devil, Diabolos. And that word means to slander, to accuse falsely. He is the liar. The word Satan means adversary, somebody who resists us. And sometimes we the Christians, well, you know, I've never encountered them. Well, there's something wrong here. If you've never encountered the evil one, either you're not a believer or he is just ignoring you because you're no threat to him whatsoever. He accuses us. He is our adversary. He opposes us. 
And when I began to realize that he is the one that is deceiving us, he continually deceives. He's deceiving the whole inhabited earth tonight. And that's what we were talking about this morning, that Dr. Jeremiah was making the point. We don't live in the lies, but we are letting that control us because we don't see this biblically from his perspective. That's true in the culture for sure because you never get the truth out of the secular media. And it happens to be true pervading the church tonight. And that's a sad commentary. Paul reminds Timothy as he reminds you and me in the last days, deception will be running rampant and it becomes dangerous because some of us are not rooted and grounded in the truth and we don't recognize the, the deception, both ignorant and the educated, male and fem female, Jew and Gentile. All of us are subject to that deception. And now that they've been kicked down to the earth, and if this is the right time frame, the middle of the tribulation, that's going to increase. And it's interesting, the cry that comes from heaven when he is cast out in, in 1210, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down he who accuses them before our God day and night. Wow. Let me put it like this, folks. Is your life such a life that Satan doesn't have anything to accuse you of before God? Or do we give him fuel for that all the time? Because of our lack of commitment. Because we are immature. We're not growing and we're control the things other than him he loves to accuse us before God that's one of his ministries he's the accuser of the brethren and when the word uses brethren he's talking about believers lost people are in his grasp anyway I don't have to worry about them and now there is the cry he has been cast down now earth has become the battlefield and those that he accuses, he said, overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. You need to take this, back, this one back to Patrick, right? How to overcome the evil one? Now, again, in context, I know he's talking about the, or the earth, tribulation, but this is how you and I overcome Satan today. I, I get weary of hearing people say, I'm pleading. If you are a believer, you don't have to plead the blood, folks. You're under the blood already. You're under that blood. That's why James says, resist him. And you resist him standing under that blood. You belong to God. And God will never allow him to do anything to you without his permission. They overcame him because of the blood. They overcame him because of the testimony of their witness. Are we doing that? And the more we're sharing Christ, the more he's going to come after us. And they overcame him because they were willing to even sacrifice their lives unto death. We, can't, we have trouble just living for him down here. Wow, and now Satan is cast down to the earth. Heaven is cleansed of all of that pollution. And it is such a joyous occasion in heaven that now they're crying out the salvation of our God has come. It hadn't come yet, but it's, all, it's in their mind, it is done. Now the process is growing closer and closer. They overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb. Wow. And by the testimony of their witness. Because they didn't love their lives. They were willing to sacrifice even unto death. One commentator put it like this. And I could. I, the non-attachment to life. Was carried to the extent of being ready to die. For their faith. 
And there are people tonight in third world countries that are doing that. They're doing that. Wow. Willingly doing that. Because of their love for the Lord Jesus. And now the heavens are rejoicing. Verse 12. For this reason rejoice heavens. And you who dwell on in them. Woe to the earth and the sea. Because the devil has come down to you. Having great wrath. Knowing that he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place. Now, underline that God has prepared a place for the Jews. Wherever that is, scholars are not agreed. Most think it's down around Petra. But God has already prepared that place for them. And now that Satan has been cast out of heaven down to the earth, he turns all of his wrath and his anger and his vengeance toward the nation of Israel, seeking to wipe them out. And God gives them the wings of a great eagle so that they might go to her place. She might go to her place. And she is nourished for time and times and half a time. What does that translate to? Three and a half years, the middle of the tribulation, all the way to the end of the tribulation. God is protecting and taking care of them. Wow, what a great truth. He's like this cage line, and the cage has been opened, and now he's turning all of that, all of that toward the Jew, persecuting them. But God will take care of them. What a tremendous truth tonight. God's already prepared this place for them. Even though we may not know the exact location, he gives them two wings of the great eagle. And this word given in the Greek is a passive voice. This is probably figures a figure of speech, but it's describing the vividness of God taking care of his chosen people. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. It's been interesting in, in the years when the Jews have migrated back. Sometimes the, the mission was called eagle wings. God protecting them, bringing them back to their promised land. In Deuteronomy 32, 11, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spreads his wings and he caught them, carrying them into his presence. I'm fascinated by eagles. I think I saw one coming home from church this morning over in the haven somewhere. But I didn't want to create a wreck in the middle of East Kings Highway, so I had to keep going. I couldn't stop and focus on it. But when you study the eagles, when, when they're ready for those eaglets to get out of the nest, the mother eagle will, quote, stir it up. She will begin to destroy that nest. She will literally push them out. And they hadn't learned to fly. And if they began to scream in horror, horror that mother eagle will come down up under that little eaglet and catch her right in the back of her of her two wings and take them back to the nest and then she'll do it all over again. Sort of like learning to swim. Sometimes you just throw them in there. What? This is how God's taking care of his chosen people. He carried them on his wings. And this always speaks of power and speed, and strength. This is, a strong, this is strong, beautiful language in the Greek, and it is in the Hebrew when you go back to the Old Testament. God guides them to the place in the wilderness he has prepared for them. Now, I just challenge you, take this. Go back to Matthew chapter 24. I, I get so weary of hearing preachers talk about these being signs of this 
will happen after the rapture, folks. Jesus is speaking to the Jews. And when we don't understand that in Romans 9, 10, and 11, he's talking about his elect, he's talking about the nation of Israel. In Matthew chapter 24, 15, and 16, Jesus warned them about this. That you need to understand that. This is coming. Just pray that you don't flee on the Sabbath. Now, if you're going to correctly interpret Scripture, who does the Sabbath refer to? Jews, it doesn't refer to you and me. Our day of worship is Sunday, the first day of the week. Just pray that your flight will not be on a Sabbath. He's warning them about what's coming. I will miraculously take care of you. I will watch over you. I will sustain you. I will protect you for a time and times and a half of time. The place has been prepared. Isn't that a wonderful truth? He can't get to them. He can't get to them. And in verse 15, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. He is so infuriated. And again, what exactly John means? It, Satan is throwing out water like a river from his mouth. He's just wanting to sweep them up in a flood and take them away. That didn't work, and it will not work. As one commentator put it, the most probable meaning of the sign is that of an overwhelming army dispatched by the beast, instigated by the serpent. The word flood is used in the Old Testament to describe both trouble and an invading army. So we're not real sure what this means, whether it's a literal flood or an army that he has enlisted to go after them. But even as the first assault by Satan, the second one, he will also, God will also intervene. The earth will open its mouth and swallow down the water. Vivid language. It's not going to touch them. God will help them. He will swallow all of that water down. Go back to the Old Testament, and this is vividly portrayed again in Psalm 124. He promised to rescue them from the flood of the enemy. The Red Sea parted, and then as they passed through, it closed back over Pharaoh's army. Oh. Exodus 15, 12. You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them up. Remember in Numbers chapter 16, verses 28 and 23, through 23, 33, when Nathan and Korah and Abram were revolting against Moses, challenging God's leadership. You remember what happened? The earth just opened up and swallowed them right down. And this is what he's going to do as they... Satan chases after the Jews. He'll open up the earth and devour whatever this is, whether it's literal water or an army. They're not going to get to that protected place. That, ought, that would certainly give comfort to those that would be hearing John or reading him. So in verse 17, he moves to a third text. So the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now keep that in your mind. These Jews who follow him, God, are certainly taken to that place and they will be protected. 
Can you imagine what a witness that will be? And obviously not all of them go because he's talking about a third tactic here. But what a witness this will be to the Jews. And when Satan is unable to deal with them, he will turn his attention to those who did not follow after the others. Maybe for some other reason, they weren't able to flee to that prepared place. But they are described as children of the of the woman, and they are faithful to keep, keep to keep the commandments of God, and they hold to the witness of Jesus. They just didn't get there for whatever reason. And Satan now has turned his attention to those that are left who didn't get to that prepared place. And folks, that's why I keep emphasizing I'm, I'm, this is the, the tribulation I'm talking about. This is why I emphasize the importance of the church in the life of a Christian. This is the place that God has promised to honor his word, to protect us, not from what we will encounter, but only in God's way. These are his present possession. They just didn't get to that prepared place. Satan is in enraged. Wow. You have to understand it, that a lot of these have accepted Christ in the tribulation period. And they're faithful to bear witness to Jesus, faithful unto death. I... What an indictment against some of us and our complacency and our indifference and our lack of commitment to Jesus today. But God will move to take care of it for the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And now in chapter 13, we are introduced to two more personalities. This is where it gets real interesting. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. And again, in Scripture, this is sometimes symbolic of all the nations of the world. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns, seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. What a picture. Now John is introducing us to two other individuals who put it like this. These two, along with the red dragon, make up the unholy trinity. Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Satan mimics God. This is the unholy trinity. And in the first two verses of chapter 13, we meet the Antichrist. And pro properly, verse 1 belongs back up to chapter 12 after verse 17. He's referring to Satan. And I hope you've come to grips with whether or not you believe in a personal, literal devil. If you don't, just look at what's happening in the culture. Look at the vileness and the wickedness and the depravity. Look at your own life when sometimes you are tempted and you yield to that. It's all around us. The testimony. And now John, as he introduces us to the Antichrist, tells us he's standing on the sands of the sea. And that is letting us know quickly what we need to understand tonight. He is the ruler of the nations of this world. He's in control of this world system. This is about to change. But he's talking about the nations in uproar and rebellion against God. And then John said, I see the dragon Satan summoned up out of the sea. A beast with ten horns, seven heads, and the ten horns have ten diadems, and on his head are written blasphemous names. Now, John has already mentioned this person back in chapter 11, verses 2 and 7. 
this one is a man. And he makes that clear. Look at verse 4. I'll come back to the other. They worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worship the beast and said, who is like the beast? This one is a man, the Antichrist. A wild, dangerous, savage, depraved individual. Sometimes we don't seem to recognize what this person's going to be like. He rises up, he is ascending by the power of Satan pictured and promised before in Revelation 13, at before Revelation chapter 13, he is going to come on the scene after the church is raptured. Paul makes that very clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You all kinds of wild theories about the Antichrist. But Paul makes it very clear he cannot appear, the, the man of lawlessness until the one restraining him is taken out of the way. You look at a world around us and you wonder if you didn't believe in the rapture. Well, wow. We've got so much depravity, so much deception. And yet Paul is very adamant the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the one holding him back is removed. And that one that's holding him back is the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'll pray that on Sunday here. Father, in the strong name of Jesus, I'm asking you to hold back the evil one from your servant. I can't do that, but he will. He will. He's described as the beast and he rises up to power the antichrist now hard for us again to imagine all of this when millions of people suddenly are missing they're just missing what devastation and chaos and disorder will reign on this earth where did everybody go it will be absolutely chaos. No stability. Nobody has an answer. I don't care who's in the White House. I don't care what the FBI comes on the networks to say. <coughs> We're working on this. We're going to just find out why all of these people have disappeared. Doesn't matter. It, the world will be thrown into chaos. And all of a sudden, out of all of this disorder, somebody arises and says, I will bring peace and order to this chaos. Or as we had one say uh, in an election a year over a year ago, I will unify this nation. That's what he's going to tell the world. And the world is so divided, it's so chaotic. And you again, you can't even imagine the disappearance of millions of people. Gone. That's the Antichrist. I have an answer. I'm not going to go back over the main source of information we've already covered is in the book of Daniel. But this is one of the greatest prophetic books in the Bible, and I mentioned that when we started the study of it. Daniel's prophecy gives to us God's program of things to come. In fact, it gives us one of the most comprehensive and chronological pictures of history as it moves to consummation and completion. 
And that ought to be a source of hope for us. I'm not going to go back over that. Daniel is the key to the entire prophetic program of God as he deals with the Jew and as he deals with the Gentile nation. And I cannot understand Matthew chapters 24 and 25 without understanding Daniel because all of this is apocalyptic literature. This is the unveiling of truth that's been concealed. And Daniel wasn't writing to give us a, a detailed account. He's just giving us the details of his own people while they're in Babylonian captivity, and he's presenting to them the presentation of God's sovereign control over the whole world, all of the world, all of it. Why? We saw when we looked at Daniel, he's dealing with that little phrase from 20, Luke 21, 24, that Jesus called the times of the Gentiles. It's hard for us to imagine. I think when I get through, I, I, I'm not sure that I'm going to go to the seven feasts of Israel. This is God's divine prophetic program. He's given it this in Leviticus chapter 23. He has a divine program, not only for Israel, but for the Jewish people as a whole around the world, for Gentile nations, and as all of these Gentile nations relate to the Jews. Jesus said Jerusalem would be trodden underfoot under Gentile domination until he returns. I remember we saw in Daniel the beginning of the times of the Gentiles started when Nebuchadnezzar took Israel into Babylonian captivity. Israel is not presently under Gentile domination, but she will be again. And all of that prophetic program, as we saw, was interrupted by the age of the church in that parenthesis. Go back and read chapters 2, 7, and 9. One of the most comprehensive prophetic revelations in all of the Bible, the book of Daniel. Out there, uh, one of the older commentators that I enjoy reading, Dr. Lee Strauss, I had the privilege of hearing Dr. Strauss years and years and years ago, and he was very old when I heard him. But this is what he quotes an official in England. This is 1959. The book of Daniel should be the textbook of every modern politician. If I had my way, I should compel not only every Christian, but the prime minister, the members of the cabinet, ambassadors, the council or service, and all diplomats to study at it. Daniel. It is a panoramic of the main political events at the end of the times of the Gentiles. Now, this is coming from a politician. I don't know if we have anybody like that in Washington today. I, I just get irritated with some of our own in Louisiana that profess to be Christian. They're more interested again in their little photo op and coming on with this blurb on Facebook about everything they're doing, but doing the right thing. And here in 1959 is a politician who wants all politicians to read the book of Daniel. They need to understand what it predicts about Europe and Rome and Syria and Egypt and Palestine and the Jews and the certain grouping of nations and the individuals that will be prevalent just prior to the advent of the Messiah. Wow. That's why I keep saying we need to have biblical perspective on everything that's happening. Now John is introducing us. This beast comes up out of the sea. Go back to Daniel chapter 7. You see... 
in both the Old and the New Testament is usually representative of Gentile nations. And in particular, and I don't have time to do all the questions right now, in particular, he's coming out of the revived Roman Empire. Daniel describes that in nine, Daniel 9.26. In fact, Daniel described him as the people who destroyed Jerusalem. Now, who was that? It was Rome. In 70 AD, they destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem. And the final, and I'll, I'll just have to wait a minute, the, the ten horns that are described on the head of this individual are a description of the first of the final Roman Empire that is composed of ten nations. And they'll be ruled over by the Antichrist. Go back to Daniel. The vision he gave to Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan Gentile king of Babylon. And it's the foundation of all the other visions that Daniel records that God gave. I'm not going back over there. But Daniel revealed the meaning of that. And when I look at it in deep depth and detail again, I see exactly what he said. Somebody asked me an interesting question this week. It's like they're studying when the when the uh, Catholic Church split, split east and west. And what caused that split? Most of us probably don't even have a clue about it. But Cliff, what about this? Daniel described four great beasts that came up out of the sea in the seventh chapter. And the fourth one was Rome. And what we're seeing today in the European Union, it's just like pieces of the puzzle being put in place. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with history. The, the Roman Empire reigned about 500 years in an undivided state. Then it split east and west. And that lasted for 400, uh, 1450 years. That becomes important in our understanding of prophecy. You can go back and study that in Daniel. I'll leave you with this. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 and 16, Jesus calls him the abomination of desolation. Paul describes him in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 as the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction. So you can put this down tonight and just chew on it next week. The Antichrist is a person. He's not a robot, not a machine. He is charismatic. He is deceitful. And he will become very very powerful. And we've already seen he will appear at the beginning of the tribulation. He's got an answer for you. He has an answer for you. So that behooves us. And I, again, if you don't believe in the rapture, you're going to be here. You, you're going through all of this. That's why if you think you're going through it all, you better understand exactly what you're going to confront with this individual and what he's going to promise you. Well, we'll stop there and I'll take up these. I think we'll just close tonight. With you. If you're here in the auditorium or you're watching online and you've never put your faith in Christ,
Holy Spirit is speaking to you very clearly, very plainly. Today is the day of salvation. You can acknowledge that to God. You can ask Him to come to you and forgive you and come into your life. Well, we remember uh, Wednesday night, John Street. I share this with you because of somebody online today hearing what we were talking they donated 15 cents. And that, that's a marvel. That's amazing. They sent me a, a, a t- text. Dr. Cliff, I would like to donate 15 pizzas for Wednesday night. And then he came back and said, well, maybe 20. And I said, no, 15 will be enough. I no. Michael has volunteered to bring them. So what I am asking you to bring, desserts, However many people will be here, I don't know, but bring desserts. And Lisa can bring her buffalo wing chip. That, that stuff is addicted back there. <laughs> uh, it's amazing to me how God works through all of that. It's amazing how he has blessed this refuge in so many ways that we don't even know. I had no idea this individual was watching none whatsoever. Pray for Wednesday night to be a time of uh, harvest and the kingdom of God. Thank, I, I failed to thank those that showed up to clean yesterday. We were few in number, but it, we've got this down to a science. I think. We were in and out of here quickly. Uh, and let me ask you, especially pray for Lori. Many of you don't understand Lori has in that. She is so faithful church, but this one has knocked her down. She got in the car to come this morning and could not even drive. So be praying for her. And it's, it's, that's a testimony in itself to have that, that disease and be faithful in the Lord. And I pray that you send her to get back in the car. I sent one yesterday. I want you to know why I'm not going to be there I'm afraid somebody will think ill of me. I don't know exactly how to put it. Uh, it's, it's looked a lot. I share Jesus this week. Pray for Robin and the Selden's family. The uh, graveside service will be Tuesday at 1 o'clock at Charles Park. Out to St. Bruno. Or one of the ministers at First Baptist, Ronnie J. Webb, will be leading that service. And the Lord will give the ministry to all of them. Anybody else? Am I overlooking something? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus, the living word. And for our scripture your divine revelation to us. I do pray for Wednesday night that you would bring not only the children but the parents and the family. You give us the boldness and the clarity to present the gospel to them. I ask you to be with Robin and Miss Ellen's family too this week. You would do what only you can do in that circumstance and that situation. Give you strength and glory to get you through. Your Bureau of Surgeons will be there to help you do that. Father, we love you and praise you and worship you. And it's a powerful, precious.